Hey, welcome to React Roundup, the podcast where we keep you updated on all things React related. This show is sponsored by Raygun and produced by Top and Devs and Envoy. Top and Devs is where we create top and devs who get top in pay and recognition while working on interesting problems and making meaningful community contributions. And Envoy provides remote design and software development services on a task basis, so clients only pay after the tasks are delivered and approved. In today's episode, we will talk about the differences between React and React Native. Also, read this as building for the web and building for native mobile applications. My name is Lucas Paganini, your host in the podcast, and joining me in today's episode are the also hosts, Chris Fuen. Hello, everybody. Peter Osa. Hi, everyone. And our very special guest, Jamon Holmgram, which is the CTO and co-founder of Infinite Red, a React Native consultancy. Yeah, hey everybody, nice to be on here. Yeah, uh, that was the short answer, right, Jamon? Because I could also talk about how you organize Chain React, which is one of the largest U.S. conferences uh, about React. And by the way, this is coming up, right? Can you tell the audience a little bit about that and where it's going to be? Yeah, absolutely. So Chain React is the only React Native focused conference in the US. It will be held here in my hometown of Portland, Oregon. Uh, it'll be July 17th through 19th. And so definitely check it out, chainreactconf.com. You get 300 to 500 React Native developers. It's all about React Native. We have workshops. We have obviously lots of talks from Meta, Microsoft, Amazon, I don't know, Shopify, they're, like everybody's there. And uh, if you want to talk or learn about React Native, it's a great place to go. And if you're a company that's looking to sponsor, we still have a few sponsorships left. They always sell out. So definitely get in touch if you're looking for that. And uh, I'm not sure exactly when people will be listening to this podcast. Could be a little bit later, but Early Bird is about to expire. So if you're if you're wanting to get a little bit of a deal, go to chainreactconf.com and get a get a ticket. Awesome. Also, and thank you for taking the time to be with us on the show. I know that you're super busy with all the content that you produce and also being the CTO and co-founder of uh, Infinite Red. So, yeah, uh, thanks so much. And let's get into it. So we're going to talk about the differences between React and React Native, also web development versus native mobile development. So uh, what do you think? Let's just summarize, like, from top of mind without going too much in in depth into it, just so that we can come up with a quick list of most important things. What do you think are quick things that people should know about that are big differences between uh, between web development and just building native mobile applications? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So a lot of people come into mobile apps thinking, well, it's an app. I've built apps before. I've even built apps for phones before, you know, in a browser context. But it's quite a bit different. User expectations are quite a bit different. There is a, a I think, a little bit higher expectation in terms of interactivity, being able to use your your uh, your touch to be able to move things and you know tap on things need to be very responsive and and quick. Performance is, is much more sensitive, I think. Uh, with you know, like like with web, there's a little bit of uh, forgiveness if you if you click on something and it loads, you know, the next page. With a mobile app or you know really any kind of like uh, like desktop apps are similar. If you click on something or tap on something, it needs to be pretty instantaneously or, or, or else people will wonder what's going on. Like did, did my computer freeze or, or like what happened here? Um, so I think that that's really important. And there's some tools that are built into React Native that help you with that and, and not just React Native, but also the native platforms and languages that come with these, uh, with these mobile uh, operating systems. So uh, I think touch is really, really important. I think that there's also some, some paradigms about how you navigate and how you move around and how, you know, like there's this concept of a stack. Like on web, you don't really have a stack of things. You navigate to a new page versus on, on a mobile app, when you tap something, it'll slide on or it'll pop on or it'll present, you know, from the bottom like a modal or, or you know, like stacks, like almost like cards on top of each other. And so you have those, you have, a lot more like tab bars. Um, you don't have those quite, I mean, you still have tabs in some sense with web, 
but it's 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 really really common on on native and there's some definite bleed between the two uh but we really have to be thinking about all of those things when we're building mobile apps because user expectations if it feels like a website they're going to be like this isn't right like you know th- this doesn't feel like an app it doesn't feel like the experience i expect and nowadays with the hybrid technologies that are available so we're talking react native mostly right since this is going to be the solution mostly adopted by our audience but Mm -hmm. there are other solutions for hybrid development too nowadays my main question would be is it possible to get to the stage where it is as good as a as an app that was built for native or are we always going to have some kind of difference just because of the technologies being used I think that, that that's a great question too, because uh, you know there there has been a movement toward like let's let's converge these technologies, let's make sure that everything is pretty well the same stuff. And I get that, I get why there's a motivation to do that. And React Native is a step that direction for sure. Uh, but with that said, there it does feel like there's always going to be some differences between the two. There's always going to be some differences in the user expectations. Although web continues to get better, it gets better at things like touch and interactions in those ways, animations and whatnot. So, you know, web is certainly moving that direction, but web always, I always think of web as being really two platforms in one. You have sort of a document like platform for viewing web pages and reading documents. And then you have that web app platform. And those are two different things and they have two different needs. On mobile, we just have apps. Like the, the document stuff, we would pull open in a browser and, and read. But if you're talking about a native app, it's an app. And so everything is geared toward an app. So it's all around it, it, interactivity and responsiveness and, and sort of like authoring and content like, like manipulation rather than consuming. Uh, although obviously there's plenty of apps that consume as well. So uh, that's kind of how I think about it. And I think that the fact that web is always kind of always has to support both of those things will always have an effect. Awesome. So let me try to make my question a little bit less abstract and try to Mm -hmm. bring it to a more concrete example. Uh, You had years of experience with React Native and just hybrid uh, technologies, right? Yeah. Yeah. We started when React Native came out uh, in 2015. So almost nine years ago now. Awesome, awesome. Uh, and do you also have experience building with just uh, regular native technologies? Before that, for about three years, we were from 2012 to 2015, we were doing, uh, so my previous company, we were doing native apps and it was mostly iOS. And actually in 2015, early 2015, our clients started asking us for Android apps because I don't know if you all remember, but back then, a lot of times people would just build iOS apps and they would just totally neglect Android. And you'd be like, well, when's your Android app coming out? Well, we might do it eventually. Uh, But eventually it was like, okay, we can't ignore this anymore. We do need to start, you know, putting out an Android app. And so uh, we were starting to look at, we start building some Android apps and we're not super fond of the experience. Like iOS was a little better. Um, and then React Native came out and we started looking at it. And my business partner, Todd Worth, actually looked at it first and he's like, hey, this is this is pretty good if, if they come out with an Android version, because at that point they only had iOS. Um, if they come out with an Android version, we should really look at it seriously. And then in September, they came out with the Android version and they released that as open source. And in October, we adopted it. And that's when uh, it's also when Infinite Red was born, because Todd and I had been kind of friends for a long time and we decided to merge our companies and that's when it happened was in October of 2015. So at that point, we're like, well, we're merging our companies together. This is a good time for like a clean break. We're all in on React Native. Awesome, awesome, gotcha. So you have experience with both scenarios and now trying to bring my early question to a more concrete example. Nowadays, is there any any situation that you can think of that you would recommend to a client to not use a hybrid technology and instead build with native technologies? Yeah, so this is a question we get from time to time. And I think the answer is when you really would never have a use for deploying to other platforms. If you're only ever gonna be deploying to iOS, 
or only ever going to be deploying to Android, then using the native technologies on that platform usually makes sense. Not always. Sometimes it still makes sense to use React Native. And I actually, so Orta Thoreau, uh, Thorox, sorry, I actually don't know how to pronounce his last name. Orta, he's known as Orta online, O-R-T-A. Uh, legendary developer, one of the ones who kind of like created Cocoa Pods, which is sort of the package manager for iOS developers. I don't know if he created it, but he's been, he's one of the ones who like uh, maintained it for many years. He is probably one of the best iOS developers that uh, on the planet. And he decided to use React Native for an iOS only app. And uh, I was blown away. I was talking to him about this at uh, React Native EU in 2019. And he said, yeah, I just, I think the experience is good. Now, I don't know if that would change with SwiftUI because SwiftUI kind of came out of, uh, SwiftUI is a response to React and React Native. It was basically like, well, we need some sort of a declarative syntax like this too. So it, it's basically Swift's like uh, version of, of React built into Swift. Um, but, uh, but at the time he, he said, yeah, it's just a better experience to use uh, React Native. And uh, so there are some times, but that can be a situation where, where you do. Anytime you're deploying to more than one platform, and that might be iOS and Android, it might be iOS and web, it might be all three, it might be TV, it might be desktop. Anytime that you have more than one platform, the business case for React Native starts getting very, very strong. It starts getting very strong. And it's, it's hard to really overstate how impactful having a common technology can be. I think people a lot of times go into this with, you know, they're sort of like trying to temper their expectations a little bit and like, well, maybe if we get some code reuse, then we'll, it'll be a win. It's much more than code reuse, a lot more than that. It affects your whole organization. I remember uh, Squarespace when they adopted React Native, they actually went and redesigned the whole floor on their office. This was pre-pandemic the whole floor to change where their developers sat in their office because of React Native. Because like they used to have these different pods, like they'd have iOS and Android and, and web, and they just moved them together. And they're like, we, we need you all to be close to each other. Cool, okay. Uh, so that that's a very, so, so that tells me that there are really no technical reasons for uh, for someone to choose to use a native technology nowadays, like in the sense of, there's just something that I cannot build without uh, using native technologies. It's really just a matter of if you're only going to support that platform, which seems to me that it would be a bad decision either way, right? Because you're kind of like making a decision now that if you want to change it two, three years in the future, then you're just stuck with it and you're, you're never going to be able to change. So uh, that seems like a, a weak reason to go with a particular, uh, to go with just native technologies. Unless like the rest of your team has a lot of experience on that, which then it's another complete different reason, right? It's like, yeah. we're going to go way faster using that because we already have experience with that. But assuming that everyone has the same level of experience uh, and maybe that's zero experience, then it would probably always, it would probably be a safe bet to say that people should always use hybrid development platforms nowadays because there's simply nothing that you that you can't do um, that would require you to not be in such hybrid platforms? Yeah, I, I, we get this question a lot. And I think that what people don't realize is that a React Native app is an iOS native app and it is an Android native app. You literally have iOS native and iOS native or Android native folders in your project. And you can go in there and run them with Xcode. You can run them with Android Studio. And uh, if you want to build something in native, literally just build it in native. It's right there. Like, it's not that hard to do. So anything you can do in native, you can do in React native projects because they have a full native setup there. Now, the second question when I tell people this is, well, then what's the point of using React native? Why wouldn't I just use the native platform if I'm already going to be using? Well, it's because you're only really doing that in like 2% of cases. You know, like you, you build out like 2% of your screens in native if you want to. Like if there's some critical interaction that you don't think you can achieve with React Native, you build that, you build that screen and then you just bring it into React Native and run it. And 
it, since everything in React Native actually boils down to a native view, a UI view on, you know, like UI kit on the iOS side and the Android layout system in uh, the Android side, I mean, it just fits right in. And there's there's like literally you can go in there and inspect and, and see how they all fit together in like the, the view hierarchy inspector and stuff in Xcode. Um, so because of that, I always say there's nothing that a native and an iOS or Android developer can do that we cannot do. And I think uh, some native developers who are a little bit stuck in their ways uh, take uh, offense to this and they're like, hey, you know, you can't say that because, you know, you're just you're just saying like we, we'll use native. It's really it's that it's that interaction between the two that I think makes React Native so powerful. With that said, it, we've we've done almost 80 React Native projects and they're not small. They're big projects like companies you've heard of. <laughs> Um, in every, in, in the vast majority of those projects, we've done almost zero or even zero native code, vast majority of them. There have been a few where we've had to do maybe up to 10% native code. I don't think we've ever had a project with more than 10% other than the brownfield projects which is a different story and i can talk about brownfield if you want but what brownfield is is it's an existing ios or android app that we're adding react native into to develop an experience within the app but that's a different story um but yeah any greenfield like built from the ground up 90 is like 90 percent is like bare bones bottom and most of them are like 99 to 100 percent uh react native code Okay, uh, let me let me jump into that brownfield example just quickly because I think it's interesting for people to at least know that this is possible, right? So if you get an, an app that was originally built just for iOS or just for Android using native technologies, how hard is it for you to gradually adopt React Native without just having to fully migrate everything to it? This is where I'm going to shamelessly plug using a consultant, especially my company, Infinite Red. I think that's when you really need a consultant uh, because it's not easy. Uh, this is some, This is what it's. It's what React Native was designed for. So it, React Native is actually very good at Brownfield, but the process of doing that is tricky. You need to do it right, and it's easy to do it wrong. It's easy to do it in a way that blows up your bundle size without really getting the ba the benefit of the uh, of what React Native brings to your app. So there are right ways and wrong ways to do this, and they they always depend on your architecture. So there's not like one blog article or one video you can watch to like get the answer for this. It's very dependent on context, and I would recommend using a consultant there. But if you're dead set on we can figure this out and we want to we want to bring in uh you know react native to build out some experiences within the app react native is totally capable of that and uh in fact it was originally built that way and and meta for example in in the facebook app which is the biggest app they own that is uh that is how they use it there so like some of the comment sections are react native the marketplace section like if you go to that in the you know uh, the, the tab you'll see that that's all react native but it's, um, but the rest, you know, there, there's kind of a mix and match of native and, and React Native views, but they're continuing to kind of build out more and more of their, app, their apps uh, functionality in React Native. They have other apps that are fully built in React Native, uh, but, but that's a good Brownfield example. There's also Amazon is doing a lot of Brownfield with, uh, with React Native. Um, and, uh, and we are working with a lot of the companies that are doing brownfield uh with you know large companies that are doing that uh so it's it's been interesting there are some downsides to doing brownfield for sure it's certainly a lot nicer to do greenfield to do kind of like you're from the ground up in a lot of ways but uh but totally possible and there are some advantages chris peter uh, i have thousands of other questions but i also wanted to give the floor to you guys a bit like i've been making questions for 20 minutes. And I don't want to, I want to make sure that uh, if you guys also have questions, you have an opportunity to, to make them. So um, what I understood from, from Peter's question and Peter, please correct me if I'm wrong, but 
Uh, it was mainly with regards to the popularity of uh, hmm. React Native versus other hybrid solutions. Uh, yeah. Is that correct, Peter? Okay. Yeah, okay, I know perfect. that Flutter is is rocking too, right? It's still yeah. pretty high in terms of usage. So how how does the hybrid technology landscape looks like at the moment? Yeah, so uh, so Flutter is more is more popular outside of the US than it is inside the US in, in a lot of ways. And I think this is because in a lot of ways, Flutter works best with Android um, and React Native works best with iOS. Uh, this is continuing to change for both of them. They're both trying to make the other platform experience better. Uh, but in the US, the iOS market is kind of the, the primary one. That's where people tend to make more money. Uh, it's ten, you know, it tends to be a little bit more affluent uh, user base, that sort of thing. Outside of the U.S., um, most countries people use Android pretty heavily, and because of that, Flutter is is pretty popular. Um, but in in absolute terms, React Native is still pretty far ahead of of Flutter, even you know even worldwide. Uh, it, it if you look at so there are some kind of biased. Uh, metrics out there and you'll see flutter is more popular than than uh, react native and and it's it's kind of like a uh it comes from a company that that does flutter or something like that uh but if you look at there there was actually evan bacon actually recently did a survey of the app store and he he looked at the top apps and in many different categories uh react native was 10 to 20 times more represented in the top 100 apps than flutter and so there's still a pretty wide gap there um react native has the benefit of keying off of the react community and the react community is gigantic huge obviously your podcast audience here is a good representation of that most of you all do react uh and so stepping into react native is a pretty short step moving into flutter is a much bigger step so there's really not a lot i wouldn't say there's like anything wrong with flutter necessarily there's some some philosophical differences in how they approach things and i wrote all about the differences between react native and flutter in my article uh titled flutter is better than react native in all the ways that don't matter <laughs> and uh i go into the ways that flutter is better than react native and it is better than React Native in some ways. Uh, and why those ways don't matter because of the things that do matter. And it really comes down to things like ecosystem, uh, developers sharing code. Um, it's a lot of non-technical reasons. Uh, in the technical reasons, they're actually quite close. And Flutter tends to beat it a little bit in developer experience. And React Native tends to beat it in a lot of ways that have to do with sharing code with web and sharing knowledge with web and stuff like that. But neither of those things are like, 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 React, like React Native and Flutter, if you take the developer experience, they're pretty close. Flutter's just a little bit better, I think, in some things. Uh, so as long as you're not like, you have to have the most incredible, you know, like, like fine tune that one thing. If that's the only thing that matters to you, then maybe Flutter is for you. But if you take it holistically, that's sort of why I think uh, React Native still continues to hold an edge. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I really want to get into differences within deployment. But before that, uh, Chris, what about you? Do you have any any questions you'd like to make? Sure. Yeah, yeah I have a few. Um, I guess the the first one kind of goes into I think what what Peter mentioned is that yeah there is there are some kind of discussions always that React Native sometimes does feel buggy or or something like that. And I, I have some experience with that. I was kind of the leader of a of a native app for almost two years. Um and I think what it comes down to is and sometimes the I I think one of the the small disadvantages of of React Native is you have like Let's say you need to get like contacts from a phone, right? And of course, there's a library for it, but then you're kind of dependent on that on that library, right? And which is usually fine; it works fine. But 
with the pace that React Native has updates itself, or you know, the, the versions change, and then you might get some dependency thing issue. And so I, I think that's that may be where this this kind of notion comes from. And I think I just just speaking from my experience, you have to be very careful with the libraries you choose and also know, I guess, know the dependencies that they're using. But but I would love to hear kind of what your experience is with that and and I guess as over in general, just how like this dependency management with React, because I think it's it's a bit more I don't want to say complex, but you just have to be a bit more careful than like with NPM, like on a web project where you can just usually these days install everything and, and it works fine. So we hear this sometimes, uh, for, or actually quite often around like, I can feel like it feels like a React Native app. It feels like it's not native. Um, and generally speaking, when people say that, I do kind of know what they mean. Like there is, there is a, uh, there is, there can be situations where where things uh, can feel not not buttery smooth, or they don't feel smooth, or if they have issues, they don't feel like they have issues in the same way that native apps have issues, because native apps obviously still have issues. Um, but really, when it comes down to it, you have to look at each app. So I'll tell you a little story. We had a we, we one of our clients is is Gas Buddy here in the U.S. Uh, it's an app that allows you to find fuel prices uh, around the U.S. And you can often save like 20% if you just drive a mile out of your way to go to a different uh, gas station to fuel up. And of course, in the U.S., we all use cars to get everywhere. And that's kind of important. And so uh, their main fuel feed where you would like scroll. Uh, it, originally, the app was was iOS and Android native. When we moved to React Native, we wanted to maintain the feel, the performance, everything needed to feel the same. We were just replatforming onto React Native. And uh, the main feed was really choppy. It was like, you know, you'd, you'd like scroll and it'd just be like chop, 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 you know, and stalling, whatever. Um, and we're like, what is going on here? You know, like, is, is this a problem? So we actually like did a bunch of performance optimizations to the React Native code that we had for the list view. Uh, for for flat flat list there, I think we started using Flash List for a while, and and uh, we had to back out of that because there were some some downsides to Flash List that didn't that we couldn't totally solve. Um, and uh, what it came down to though was the native ad, like the ads that were in the feed, which were native code, were the ones with the performance problem. We went in there and optimized the native code, and then the list was smooth and felt native. So it wasn't even our code. It wasn't even React Native code. It was an ads platform that was causing the problem. And so if someone were to use that app, knowing it's a React Native app and someone who's skeptical of React Native, they might go in there and be like, this app sucks. It feels like React Native. It feels like it's not native. Not knowing that it's the native code that caused the problem. you know. And so often our biases kind of come into this. So you have to look at each individual situation and say, what caused the 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 performance issue um and so definitely something to keep in mind uh i know that we can achieve totally you know buttery smooth performance on on react native and we've done it many many times a good example of this is mercari uh, mercari is sort of like an ebay uh, competitor it's one of our clients as well we help build the app we put a whole bunch of time into that along with their team and uh they had 4.8 stars the uh, average 4.8 stars be, uh, with their older like native app and uh with l literally millions of reviews and we're like we can't go from that to something less it has to maintain 4.8 average stars and uh since we launched the new react native 4.8 stars uh over the last two years and it's maintained that so people are very happy with it it's buttery smooth in in pretty much every case, and when the, when it's not, we can go in and fix it. There's ways to fix it, and so uh, that's that's a really really you just have to. I mean, at the end of the day, performance always comes down to someone caring and putting in the time. That's really what it is, and all of the tools are there to do it. Um, third party dependencies is actually a very good question. Uh, that that's that's something that I think 
probably is one of the more it's both a strength and a weakness of react native because you have a vast ecosystem of third party libraries but that also means you have a vast vastly different level of quality across these different libraries and um you know if you're you're relying on a, a library and it's not maintained or uh you know something changes and you got to go in and like patch it that can be kind of annoying uh but the benefit is you don't have to write it in the first place you know because it's there and someone did write it and there's a huge ecosystem of that uh so it's definitely something to keep in mind um i do i will say that expo uh the the company expo and also the the kind of ecosystem around expo they tend to have the most high quality react native libraries and you can use expo libraries in a regular react native app without using expo across everything and so everything we do pretty much brings in expo libraries and those are highly they're well maintained they're really set up well um and uh and and well designed so that has really helped a lot basically expo has become the de facto kind of uh caretaker of the third party ecosystem for stuff that really matters I, I think that's kind of the main thing we still use things like coco pods and gradle and stuff on the native side um so if you need something you know a third party uh from that side we can always bring it in there's also some really interesting things coming up with the new architecture and there's been some experiments with integrating native script with react native so native script is very interesting actually you should probably uh you pay attention over the next few months because there's going to be some new announcements coming out where you can actually access native apis directly in your javascript code just by basically importing them and writing them out and just using them in a way that's really cool that native script has had for a while native script kind of works this way it binds things automatically so you have all these bindings just automatically and then you can use them in your in your react native javascript code without incurring a cost because it's going to go over the javascript interface the jsi so instead of going over the bridge and doing a bunch of serialization a bunch of like overhead it's literally just calling from your javascript engine hermes or uh or jsc but usually hermes directly into the native code so it literally just passes like the execution pointer over there shares memory it sounds dangerous it's a little dangerous but it, it works really well and you can essentially access the same memory and call the same apis in your native code directly from your javascript code so stuff like that's going to be a pretty big deal when it lands because that will really like eliminate that barrier between native and javascript awesome yeah thanks yeah i remember that's that's sometimes the issue is that if you you're relying on that one library that has that one bridge and then if they change React Native or something changes, then it, the whole thing breaks. But that's that's quite cool. I had I also have kind of like a like a joke follow up question because when I last used React, it was like I think six zero point six two, and I think they're already on seventy or something. Do you think it will ever become a one point zero zero <laughs> software? I tweeted out this meme a while back, uh, which is the guy who's like looking in anticipation. It's two frames. One, you know, like, and it was like, it said the, the title was React Native 0 0.99. It's like this. And then the second one is him just kind of like, and, and it says React Native 0 0.100. And uh, he, he's just kind of dejected. Like, oh, I thought it was going to be 99 1.0. Um, really so the new architecture is landing in the next one uh 0 0.74 i mean it, it landed before but it'll land like by default so the new architecture has been like two years in the in the, the make it maybe longer actually i think it's been longer and um so that is a really key part we really can't get to 1.0 until the breakage stops and that has been the big thing. I know like other frameworks will just like roll out 1.0 and then just do 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 and break things all the time. With React Native, they really want to get to a point where they can commit to backwards compatibility. And, and this is true of React as well. You can run like class-based components in a React 
uh, app, which hasn't been around for years, you know, in terms of what they recommend. But, uh, but you know, when hooks came around and even when they move on to like React server components and stuff, they're going to maintain that backwards compatibility. It's really important. Like backwards compatibility is really important to the React team. So React Native, until they can like commit to saying this is going to be backwards compatible, uh, they, they don't really want to go to 1.0. But there is a roadmap now and it is starting to take shape. Um, and so I think that's going to be coming in uh, hopefully pretty soon. But yeah. We're coming up on the 10 year anniversary. It's probably about time. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So let's see if we can talk a bit about deployment too, because I think this is a gigantic challenge for people that think, oh, I have web development experience. This is called React Native. I know React, so I can just build a native app. And then they realize how different the deployment process is it's just we're we're so used to deploying API changes at the same time as the front end and just expect everyone that is running the front end to be running the latest version, which is compatible to the latest API version. And that's simply not the case with installable applications. You can have clients that are using a version of your application from one year ago and they are simply not going to update. So you have to decide, what are you going to do? Like, are you going to support some very old versions of the uh, the backend API? Are you just going to uh, require them to update? So uh, there's so many challenges that come with that. So I would like to hear a bit from you. How do you, um, how do you recommend web developers to think about this different way of deployment and updating process? And also, if there is currently any way for us to have the cake and eat it too, right? Can we currently have an installable application that uh, would be kind of like a PWA in the sense that it would be installable, but at the same time, it would always get the latest versions of the, uh, of the web assets from a server, and then it would always be running the absolute latest without users having to, to manually update. I love this question uh, and settle in because we got a few things. I know we're going over time here. I'll go as quick as I can. <laughs> so first off, you have the App Store and the Play Store and those have a review process. And this is one of the things where people, web developers correctly have a criticism of native apps. It's a walled garden, Google and Apple control it and they will sometimes deny your app for the dumbest reasons, absolute dumbest reasons. One of my friends just had his app denied with a very small bug fix for some massive policy violation that's not even true, does not even exist in his app. Uh, but they have done denied him six times now for a policy violation that does not exist in his app. It's not there. He keeps saying, it's not there. Show me where it is. And they just keep saying, we're not going to approve this because you have this this thing in your app that you can't have. He's like, I, and I've had these, these situations myself, very frustrating. Um, so that is a, a very good criticism of native apps that pushes people toward PWAs and things like that, even though users don't want PWAs, but that's a whole nother discussion. Um, so that's a big one. Uh, you have to abide by their, their rules. You do get some value out of the review process though. There's some QA ish stuff like, does your app even start? I've submitted apps that break right away and they've caught it and I'm embarrassed, but at least they caught it. Right. Um, the downside also is the, the turnaround time. So this is not just, Hey, we broke the build. Let's push up a new version. Now we're good. Um, or, or revert or whatever. So, uh, so that can be, I mean, sometimes, you know, a day, sometimes it's, it's a week and you just have no control and no transparency into that. You can expedite on the Apple side, which sometimes works and you can't expedite on the Google side. There's just no way. So uh, a lot of frustrations on that side of things. You have a different build process. You're, you're creating native binaries. Not all native binaries are the same between different devices. They have to be, you know, customized. So those things all have to be kind of built in. And like you said, Lucas, there's, older versions uh, that can be out there. So you have to handle that in your application code. You have to reach out to the API and say, what version are you expecting? What's the lowest version you can you know, accept? 
if it's if if it's beyond my current version i need to pop up a message to the user saying hey we're really sorry but we no longer support this version go to your app store or play store and update please which is very frustrating with people with older devices that can't you know it doesn't support it right um but so so it's something to keep in mind react native does support pretty old versions though uh itself um and then uh the 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 over the air updates is kind of a big one so um in the past we you could so because you ship a either javascript bundle or a hermes bytecode bundle those are roughly equivalent hermes bytecode is binary and is built for hermes uh but and the other one would be a javascript bundle which would look a lot like what you would ship on on web uh but it's just one file you know customized for for uh for react native you can replace that so you can actually reach out to a server and you can say, hey, I need a new bundle. Download it, hot swap it over, and restart your app. Yeah, like internally restart it. And now you're running on the new bundle. There are ways to, you can either do this manually, literally just download it yourself and do your own swap or you can use things like EAS update, Microsoft Code Push, which is going away, by the way, uh, in a year. So you don't want to use that anymore, but it used to be a big thing. Um, I think there's some other options too. We haven't really used them. Uh, we've either hand rolled our own, used Microsoft Code Push, or used EAS update. And so that can replace your whole bundle. And that's like a complete re, you know, it's it's downloading everything. Um, you can't change native code that way. Not only uh technically, but also it's against the App Store rules. So replacing the JavaScript or Hermes bytecode bundle is fine replacing native code or compiled code is not fine. And then lastly, in the future, you're going to be able to do this per component. And that's through React server components. So React server components is going to be a, a, allow you to just replace certain components as you go. And it's going to get much closer to what you're talking about there, uh, about having kind of more real time kind of web feel to it, where when you when you go to a new, you know, a new component, it's going to have all the latest and greatest updates. So that's kind of the the landscape. It's headed that direction, and it's also something that Flutter can't do. It's something that Kotlin multi-platform can't do, and it's something that Native really can't do either. Uh, none of those other competitors can do over-the-air updates. It's just not. It's like Flutter. The Flutter's team has looked at it and basically said, "We're not going to support it. It's just not going to be possible because of the architecture." It's actually probably React Native's most killer feature if you really boil it down over the over the air updates. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and you were saying that um, users don't really want PWAs, uh, mm -hmm. and although from a developer's perspective, they they do help a ton if you're just a yeah. web developer wanting to have something installable. Um, do yep. you think that this is this is changing over time? Because like as a user, it's not that I don't want a PWA, it's that I don't want a different installing process. That's it. Yes, correct. I, I, yeah. I don't really care if it's a PWA, yeah. if it's a complete native app, if it's a hybrid. Um, I, I, I really don't mind what yeah. is being used internally. I just don't want to have uh, an install installment process that is different from what I'm used to, which is going to the app store and downloading it from there. Yeah. But other than that, I really don't care. And in that sense, mm -hmm. can't we just have uh, an app shell that simply exposes a web view internally and then you have both of both, uh, the best of both worlds? Is that possible? So Expo kind of tried this where they built sort of a shell that you could load in different um, apps. And it was a really cool idea that Apple shut down. They just said, no, we're not going to allow this. And uh, th this may take some regulation because Apple has every incentive to keep people going through their app store and paying them 30%. Um, and they're they're extremely... Not only are they resisting governments or resisting doing this themselves, they're resisting governments doing this. So they'll do it in a way that is like the most barely compliant, but worst possible user experience possible. And it's really, really frustrating. I agree with you, Lucas. If you could go to the app store and hit install 
and an icon pops up on your desktop and when you tap it it's a pwa in a thin shell nobody would care nobody would notice right other than the fact that maybe the experience isn't quite what they want because it's a web view um that's you know that could change uh, i think it's better on android pwas are much better on android on ios so if you talk to someone who's an iphone user they're going to say pwas suck because they do <laughs> if you talk to an android user they're going to say pwas are okay because they are and so that's kind of like the difference between the two anytime you see someone saying pwas suck they're an iphone user you know it and uh anytime that you see people advocating for pwas it's going to be probably an android user um so that just he- seems to be kind of a, a differentiation there google also likes their 30 percent but they're a little bit less reliant on it than than Apple is. And so Apple is just fighting tooth and nail um, to keep them out of the App Store and keep them, you know, from being easy to install and stuff like that. So uh, on the other side of things, let's just take all of that out of it. Um, I do think that the experience of using native views is important because you can ship an app to the App Store that is just a web view. And I've done it before. where It's just a web view and then you just use everything in a web view. Um, and I just don't think that the experience is quite there. Uh, that's why React Native exists, because then you can create native views and native experiences using web technologies, but not a web view. And, and currently, there isn't any framework out there that that just relies on on this structure. Like it's just a um, it just serves a web view and, and wraps your your app and generates binaries. Uh, there is. There's uh, there's Cordova. And there's Ionic, and back in the day there was Fo- PhoneGap, um, and those things all uh, they they have that philosophy, uh, and there are apps that use it. Um, generally speaking, the experience is not you're just not able to ex- deliver the experience that a high end app would really want. Um, I don't think we could have shipped Mercari using the WebView approach. I just really don't think it would have worked. Um, the, the, the quality just wouldn't have quite been there, even with Capacitor, which Capacitor is very good on the Ionic side. Ionic side. Um, they have done really the best possible job with a web view that you can do. It's it, like, they, you really can't get better than the Ionic Capacitor um, approach. It's just an inherent limitation of the technology, in my opinion. Okay. Okay, uh, and, and and also even if we were to use them, um, from my understanding, they don't download the files remotely, right? You would you would be generating a binary that has the files from the build from that particular moment in time. So if you were to generate a new version and put it on your uh, on your web domain, it's not like all the Cordova applications would download from it and serve. They would still be serving the old version that is that has the web assets bundled with it. Yeah, that is correct, although you can update it. Uh, but yes, that is correct. Uh, that's that's actually, a that was a decision that they made just for uh, startup time, making sure startup time isn't too slow. Okay, okay. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, I yeah. think we should start wrapping up. <laughs> that, that was a lot, and there's still so much more that we could talk about. So. I'd be happy to do a, a part two anytime. Um, sure. But yeah, yeah th- thank you so much for, for your time, uh, Jamon. And let's do let's do some promos. Um, why don't you start and tell us some of the things that you'd like to promote? Yeah, absolutely. So first off, Chain React, uh, our conference. Please do check it out, chainreactconf.com. Uh, tickets are I, if you're if you're Still listening to this now here in kind of late April, you should still have a couple days left to buy early bird tickets. Otherwise, uh, the price goes up a little bit. So uh, try to sneak that in now. But either way, it's still worth it. 300 to 500 React Native developers in Portland, Oregon, July 17th through 19th. Uh, It's a two-day conference, but there's a day of workshops. There's a beginner, intermediate, and advanced workshop there. Uh, So you can get any of those uh, workshops uh, there. We redid them. The intermediate one is actually going to be taught with Expo. So Expo staff are going to be there uh, teaching the, the intermediate workshop. Um, 
also uh react native radio is my podcast so if you uh you know obviously you're listening to this amazing podcast but also if you want to get more react native in your your feed uh go subscribe to react native radio that's reactnativeradio.com and that uh we're coming up on episode 300 now of of that episode of that uh podcast and then uh lastly of course my my consultancy uh infinite red infinite.red we are 30 people uh, mostly in the US uh, almost all in the US and uh we only do react native so if you need some help with your react native project um you know hit me up uh either on social media or just send me an email jamin at infinite.red uh happy to chat about your project see if it's something we can help with we're all senior level we're all very senior uh this is like a spec ops you know like highly skilled team and uh you want us to come in put a team of of two people uh guiding your team it'll go much faster go much better it'll be more maintainable long term we have customers who have been with us for almost a decade uh, people tend to stick with us once they start using us just because of the the high quality. So uh, check us out, infinite.red. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to promote the two companies that produce the show. So again, top and devs for anyone who wants to learn more about just software development in general. There are so many other podcasts available at top and devs, not just about React, but also about Angular, which I host myself, and several other topics such as DevOps and uh, machine learning, etc. And also for anyone who is interested, so uh, Jamon was plugging his consultancy. And for anyone who is looking for something more focused on just regular web development, uh, we also have Envoid. Uh, so unvoid.com. So if you're interested in that, the differences between Envoid and other software development and design consultancies is that you only pay after the work is delivered and approved. So you have predictable costs because you know beforehand how much each, each task is going to cost. And you also have uh, predictable quality because if it's not up to your standards, you can just ask for changes up until you approve it and you only have to pay after you approve. So you make sure that the quality is always going to be on par with your expectations. So if you're interested in that, uh, do check out envoy.com. And yeah, these are going to be my promos for today. Um, Chris, how about you? Yeah, I think this week I'm going to actually promote a React Native related tool, not not mine, uh, but this is uh, Fastlane, and I'm sure Jamin, you've you've heard of this one. It's it's an yeah, amazing absolutely. it's an amazing tool. I mean, you can when they say like it helps you automate Android and iOS, you can go even down to the screenshots of what you upload to Google Play. So uh, it's a it's an amazing tool um, that can help you. To, deploy your apps maybe maybe something for for another episode at some point for us to discuss absolutely we've used them for years and years and it's amazing awesome and peter how about you oh yeah this week i, I don't have anything this week but yeah i will probably in the future i have the course coming up but yeah more details be given okay awesome all right so um we're gonna finish this episode and just to have this registered on our actual show, for those of you that might not see this comment, uh, we got a comment from Polar Knights, which I think is just brilliant and super funny. It was saying, as a barber, I love that this is like the perfect evolution of beard growth. So we have uh, from Chris to Jamon to me and to Peter, the perfect evolution of, of beard growth. <laughs> But, but yeah, I love it. <laughs> super funny comment. Uh, yeah, so guys, thank you so much for being on the show. For the audience, thank you so much for sticking up to the end. That was a very long one, so I appreciate your attention. I hope you extracted a lot of value. I'm eager for the part two with Jamon whenever we have time. But also, if you want more content about React and just pick Jamon's brain, in the meantime, definitely check out some of the conferences that he's going to be part of. So React Conf and also Chain React. Uh, don't forget to check those out if you're interested in that. And well, have an excellent week, and I will see you in the next episode. <laughs>